So the main historically important thing that happens during Henry's reign, reign is the break from Rome. Do you have any idea what that means? He founded the Church of England. He broke away from the Roman Church. The Roman Church is another name for the Roman Church. The Catholic Church. Okay, so this university is, 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 is part of that. Okay, the Jesus guy, they are Catholics. Okay, this is a, uh, a Catholic university, supposed to be. Okay. So, in England broke away from the Catholic Church of Rome during the time of Henry VIII. Okay, I'm going to start with Catherine because she was a remarkable woman. And one thing that we'll find out during this course is that there were quite a lot of remarkable women during this time. Right? We, we often think that women didn't have an important part to play in society. Um, and it's true that most women didn't go to school, didn't get a, much education or anything, but there were definitely exceptions, and Catherine of Aragon would be one of those exceptions. And of course, if Arthur hadn't died, history might be very different. She married Arthur, and things could have been very different if he hadn't died. But he did die. And it was Henry who became the future king and not Arthur. Now, Arthur and Catherine had married just a few months before the death of Arthur. And then these plans for her to marry Henry came up after Arthur died. It was a little bit of a you know, kind of embarrassing situation for everybody. Her family are saying, oh great, she's married the you know, English prince, she's gone, great, wonderful, I hope she'll be very happy. Ah, okay. And she, she must die. And then he dies. And then the English are also like, the, you know, what are we going to do with her? What we don't, her parents don't, we don't want her back. <laughs> don't, don't send her back. We don't want her. Okay? So she's kind of stuck. And so the, the plan arises to, for her to marry Henry, who is um, several years younger than her. Um, and there were problems. The, the custom when a woman got married was for her family to pay money to the man's family. It was called a dowry, all right? Uh, this word here, dowry. Money paid by the woman's husband, sorry, by the woman's family to the husband's family. And half of it hadn't been paid. So there was this kind of kinker going on with um, Henry Nana say, say, you know, give me the money, give me the rest of the money. And uh, her parents back in Spain said, well, she didn't know, you know, if her husband's dead, you know, why should we pay? He's dead, for goodness sake. <laughs> so this went on for quite a long time. And uh, even so, the agreement was made in 1503 for them to get married. Henry was five years younger than Catherine, so he was too young at, at the time to marry. It was considered that three years later, when he was 15, he would be old enough to marry her. However, that didn't happen. Henry VII was very worried about this marriage, not just, not just because um, the money hadn't been paid, but also because shukyo no seisho no hanashi, that the Bible said you, you should not marry your husband's brother. Okay, and they, they went and took me, they, they said, you know, Romaho kara kyoka wo will, will you let us do this in this case? 
And the Pope said, yes, you know, well, uh, that's okay, no problem. And on top of that, somewhat wet, she herself said, look, we were married, but the guy was sick. I mean, we never actually, you know, we never actually had sex. We couldn't. He was too ill. So anyway, I'm still a virgin. So it shouldn't be any problem. Okay? All her life, she insisted that she never actually slept with Arthur. This will, you will see this becomes important later on. So the Pope gave permission. In, in 1505, the Pope said, yes, it's okay, the marriage can go ahead. Uh, uh, well, you know, it took time to travel to Rome in these days and, and get back again. It took, some of these things would take a bit of time. And anyway, the plan wasn't to marry until 1506. Um, and then Catherine's mother, the uh, Spanish queen, died with no children. So suddenly, Catherine's value goes down. Catherine is the daughter of the Spanish king and queen. But the queen has died with no children. So when the king dies, she won't be the daughter of the Spanish king and queen, and she won't be in the royal, because they don't have any children. What will happen? So her value goes down in Henry's eyes. He says, I want my son to marry a real princess, not a princess who's, you know, going to, uh, her father will die and then she'll be nobody. So, uh, and they're still fighting over the dowry. They're still fighting over the money. And it just seemed like nothing's going to, this is never going to work out. And then, boom, Henry died. And Henry VIII, the next king, the, the, he says, my father, as he was dying, he said, you must marry Catherine. Catherine was all about Catherine. Okay, but he had him on Catherine and Dickie. You know, <laughs> nobody could prove it, could they? He, the, Henry was dead. Henry VII was dead. Uh, and he insisted that his father wanted the marriage to go ahead. And so that's what happened. Um, yeah, I think we've got something about that here. Um... She was, as I said, an unusual woman. She was, she was um, very uh, educated. The father's dying wish for them to marry was probably unlikely. Probably didn't happen. Uh, Henry probably just made that up. But as I said, between those years after Arthur dying and uh, Henry VIII marrying her, she had a really difficult time. Her parents didn't want her back in Spain. No, she didn't have any money. The English royal family didn't see, why should we give her money, you know? Uh, and the, her parents in Spain, well, they weren't even sending the dowry. They weren't giving her money. She had, she had to be very clever during this time. She had to become a businesswoman. She sold off her jewelry to get money. She figured out ways. She was very clever. She didn't panic. She kept it, her... Uh, head together very, very well, and she even became the ambassador for Spain, the first, the only woman ambassador in Europe, okay, at that time. So she was um, special. She had special abilities in a difficult situation, coming to a foreign country where she didn't speak the language, she managed to, to, to survive, and she managed to show her ability in that situation. I say she didn't speak the language because she didn't speak English, although she learned English, of course. But she did speak We think of English as the international language now. In those days, the international language would be, hmm? no, no, Latin, Latin. Although the Roman Empire had ended a thousand years before, the Bible was still written in Latin and published in Latin. 
was read in Latin in the church. The church ceremony, the Misa, was all in Latin. Uh, documents, legal documents, Horitz Tota, uh, written in Latin. Latin was the international language of Europe in those days. So, of course, she would be able to speak with other educated people through Latin. And she was also um, very interested in philosophy, this uh, humanist, humanist philosophy, philosophy that's based on uh, our humanity. Uh, you can, humanism, uh, before this, shukyo, shukyo, you know, religion was the center of everything, and you, you live on this planet just to uh, decide when you go to heaven, when you die, when you go to hell. Your life on this planet is nothing. Uh, humanism starts to look at the importance of our life and our relationships with, with, with each other. And she was very interested in this, and she had long discussions with the philosophers of the time, famous philosophers like uh, Erasmus, Thomas More, uh, and the Spanish philosopher Vives, who, who came and lived in England during that time. So she was one of the, or possibly at that time, the most uh, capable and uh, intelligent and successful woman in, in Europe, or certainly one of the very few. The only weakness was she couldn't have children. She never gave Henry a son. Um, she did have a daughter, but uh, Henry wanted a son. This was the thinking in those days. Remember when Catherine's mother dies with no children, all right, the thinking isn't, wait a minute, Catherine herself, she could be the new queen of Spain. It had to be a man. If there's no son, then the family uh, will not rule Spain. Now, uh, that's something else that's very important. That's going to change with the Tudors. Her daughter will become queen. All right? But at that time, Henry could not imagine that his daughter would become queen. He only wanted a son. And so, remember, she's five years older than him. 20 years later, she's in her 40s, and he, she's never going to give him a son. So he starts thinking, how do I end this relationship? Now, one aspect of the Catholic Church uh, is not so kibishi these days, but it's still true that the Catholic Church does not normally allow divorce. And in those days, it was much more strict. You cannot divorce. Okay? It doesn't matter if she's sick or if she if any there's almost no reason possible to to divorce. So I put a different word here. He was looking not for a way to divorce, but a way to annul. To annul means to end, or to say it becomes nothing. Their relationship becomes nothing. How will he do this? He's thinking, ah, I don't want my wife. She married my brother. She married my brother. I got special, special permission from the Pope. The Pope said I could marry. But in the Bible it says, the Pope was wrong, wasn't he? The Pope should never have said that. The Pope's missing. I will go and tell the Pope you, or I will send somebody to the Pope and say, look, you should not have given me permission to marry her. It goes against the Bible. So that's what he did, okay? His plan was not, everybody says, you know, Vicom, you know, he, he divorced his first wife. Um, in the popular thinking, that's what happened. But re really, Kuashkuyeva, 
uh, strictly speaking, he didn't divorce her. He wanted to annul the relationship, to make the relationship nothing. To say, Saisho kara, sono kekko wa kekko ni koritsuteki ni kekko dewa nai, It was never a marriage, legally speaking, from the beginning. That was his annulment. I'm putting annulment, not divorce. Okay? She's 40 years old. It's clear she's never going to have a child. And he starts having an affair. He's had lots of affairs, by the way. And then a couple of years later, he fell in love with Anne Boleyn, probably seen the movie, <laughs> I don't know, the famous movie of Anne, um, and she's known as Anne of a Thousand Nights. Three years, roughly speaking, a thousand nights. Okay. Well, Anne was different from her sister. The sister had an affair with him, I, I didn't know him much that. Uh, he had lots of IG. But Anne said, no, 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 no. If you want me, you have to marry me. So, uh, partly because he really wants Anne, but also because Anne, he believes, can give him a, a son that he wants. He tries to end this relationship with Catherine, saying that she was his brother's widow, and therefore, uh, he should never have been given permission, dispensation, permission to, to marry her. The Pope made a mistake. Because in the Bible it says, If a man shall take his brother's wife, it is an impurity. He hath uncovered his brother's nakedness. They shall be childless. They shall be childless. He thought, yeah, Paddy, that's why I can't have a son. It says so in the Bible. I'm cursed. Because this woman, it says in the Bible, will never give me a child. Of course, he had a daughter, but he didn't count her. Okay? He wanted a son. And the Bible says we shall be childless. Yeah, buddy, that's why I can't have a son. I have to end this marriage with her. Well, the Pope said... No. He was friendly with her family. He was friendly with uh, Ferdinand, her father. He was friendly with the Spanish. And the Spanish would have been very unhappy with this. So uh, he said no. And the other thing he said was, Sono seisho no kotoba. Nana san ga ikite, ikite ni. Nara, sono muru ga hari. Kedo, shinde ni nara. Nashi. There's no rule about uh, when the brother is dead. In fact, uh, in a different place in the Bible, it says it's your gimu to marry your brother's wife if the brother is dead. All right, so the Bible says um, completely the opposite of what Henry was arguing. This is only true when she's alive. Oh, sorry, when, when the husband is alive. So the Pope would not agree. And anyway, Catherine is saying, Tony Kaku, I never had sex with the guy. Okay, so it's, it doesn't matter what the Pope says. I was a virgin when I married you, Henry. So this marriage is, you know, it's, it's our marriage. I was never married to Arthur. In, because again, if, if they didn't have sex, it wasn't legally a marriage. Okay? So, uh, those are the arguments against. Very strong arguments. The Bible uh, says, does not say what Henry wants it to say, and she never slept with Arthur anyway, and the Pope will not cooperate. So, Henry basically says, well, I don't care about the Romaho. I don't care what he says. I'll do this my way. And he went to court in England, and in 1533, the court said that, Ketkondewana. Catherine and Henry were never married. It's a null marriage. And uh, he'd already, before this, he'd already decided this himself 
and he'd married Anne, and his marriage to Anne was made legal in the same year, a few days later, a week later, and Yappari, obviously, the Pope now says, Henry, Okay, you're out. Okay? He's excommunicated, kicked out from the church. And if Henry is kicked out, Henry is the king, so the country is kicked out. England is out of the Catholic Church. Okay? So this is the break with Rome. Because he wanted to be uh, to have a son and he wanted to end his marriage with Catherine, the country stopped being a Catholic country at that time. And then the next year, in 1534, um, he made an act of Parliament, a new law, saying that the head of the church in England is the king, not the pope. And so 1534 is really the turning point. The king, the, head, the king is the head of the church, not the pope. So it's not a Catholic church anymore. This all started in 1529. It, it completely finished in 1537. So during those years, the uh, different things were happening. The divorce was, uh, the annulment was going through. The different legal changes were happening. But by the end of that, England was separate from the Catholic Church. So this is the beginning of Eikoku Kyokai. And uh, England's break with Rome is happening at the same time as many other countries in Europe are also breaking with Rome, especially in the north of Europe. Okay, remember, the Church of Rome is the Catholic. Do you know the name Martin Luther? You heard of him? Yeah? I don't mean Martin Luther King, you know, the American black rights activist of the 1960s. I mean Martin Luther. All right? He was, he was a Catholic at the beginning. He was a Catholic monk. He lived in a Shadori in a, in a monastery. He was a Catholic monk. And he noticed that the teaching of the Bible was different from the teaching of the church. Not in one thing or in two things, but in 95 different things. The Bible said one thing, the church said something different. The Bible says this, the church says this. The Bible says this. He made a great big list. And the story is that he put it up on the door of the church in his town in Germany where he lived. And this is the beginning of something called, do you know the name for this change? You don't know it in English, okay? It's called the, the Reformation. The reforming of the church. The church is formed in a different way. Uh, and it's very often, we use the word, the Protestant Reformation. These people were protesting against the uh, Catholic Church and saying, the Catholic Church does not follow the Bible. And basically, uh, what you had was, you know, Jesus Christ lived here. Uh, time went by, after about 400 or 500 years, the, to begin with, people based their understanding of the religion on the Bible, and then the church started making, kind of, slowly making different decisions and going in a rather different direction. It decided 
uh, that the priests can't marry. It decided that uh, if you do something wrong, you have to go to the priest and ask for forgiveness. It decided these things that were not in the Bible. Okay, so these people were not arguing, let's do something new. They were saying, let's go back. Let's go back to the time before the church started to go in the wrong direction. That's the way they thought about it. That's the way they saw it. Okay, so Henry's argument with the Pope about his marriage with Catherine is happening at the same time as this Protestant Reformation in Europe. Well, we often think, or the, the old story is that England begins to be a Protestant country because of Henry. Often the old story. This is not really true. Henry hated the Protestants. Now, I studied Latin at school, and I have read letters written by Henry to Martin Luther in Latin, and letters written by Martin Luther to Henry. And they are really, really, really rude. You would be so surprised, you'd be so shocked, okay? Henry writes to Martin Luther, you know, English. I never knew Latin could be so rude. Uh, so, and, and, and Luther writes back to Henry in the same sort of very direct, very rude personal attack. They hated each other. They, were, they, they, they had communication through letters. Very, very rude. Okay, it's lucky that Luther never met Henry. Uh, they would probably have killed, tried to kill each other physically. They hated each other. Henry was never a Protestant. Not in the way that we think about Protestant normally. So it's kind of ironic, but Henry separates from the Catholic Church at the same time as the Protestants in other parts of Europe are also separating from the Catholic Church. For a completely different reason. In fact, uh, he was called Fidei Defensor, in Latin that means the defender of the faith, it means uh, the Pope rewarded him and said, you are a good Christian. You are a great Christian man. Uh, so before this problem with the marriage, Henry wrote books against Luther, Henry was strongly against Luther, and the Pope saw Henry as a strong support for the Catholic Church. Now, after this break with Rome, Henry had to cooperate a little bit with the Protestants in his country. Okay? Uh, the first compromise was to let the Bible be translated. Seisho, ego de shimashita. Sono mai da tengo shita. You could only read the Bible in Latin. It was kimchi in England to read the Bible in English. And again, it's kind of ironic because three years before this, he burned a man for translating the Bible into English. And then that man's translation, most of it was used again in the new translation. So uh, <laughs> he punished that man, he killed him. And then he used this translation anyway. Yeah, this man here, William Tyndale, was burned in 1536 for translating the Bible into English. And his dying words were, uh, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. And then three years later, the King of England said, OK, let's translate the Bible into English. Bad timing for uh, William Tyndale. Uh, 
And then in 1539, the Great Bible, which was based mostly on Tyndale, was uh, published by Henry. And it is as important as Shakespeare in shaping and forming the English language. Uh, we, we can say, no Tyndale, no Shakespeare. Tyndale, his translation, the way he used English, the way he shaped the English language in his translation, made English the language that Shakespeare could then build on to write his famous plays and poems. And so the translation of the Bible was one of the big things that Henry did. The other big thing that he did was to end the system of monasteries, the Shadori, okay, that they had to go. This was his other big reform. He closed the convents for the, for the nuns, the Shisuda, the women, and he closed the monasteries for the, for the monks, the men. And this happened between 1536 and 1541. And in one of Shakespeare's sonnets, Shakespeare is famous. Uh, there's a big theory about was Shakespeare himself Catholic, okay? And Konodai Gaku no Kyone Nakushite Shimai Nashita no Milwado Sensei, Jesus Kai no Milwado Sensei. His theory was very strongly Shakespeare was a Catholic. Um, you know, arguing about the reality, could Shakespeare have been a Catholic? I don't think so. Okay? But uh, certainly I think he does show a kind of nostalgia for the old days. He talks about bare ruined choirs where late the sweet birds sang. Because the music of the monasteries, the singing of the monasteries was very famous. And he writes about the bare ruined choirs, Zangyang Shots. And then lately, late in this case doesn't mean also, it means uh, psyche, psyche magic. Lately, uh, the, 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 the sweet birds sang. Kibe na ongaku shimashita kedo. And this really helped Henry economically. He could make a lot of money out of this because the monasteries were, um, were, were very rich. And as soon as he closed them, he said, well, that's all mine now. And he gave it, he gave it to the other high-level elite people so that they would uh, support Henry. Okay, he, he was saying, you, you support me and I'll give you this land. You support me, I'll give you these treasures. So all the wealth of the monasteries he used to make his own position stronger. And, of course, uh, to pay for his wars that he was having. He was fighting in Europe, uh, and that helped to pay for the wars as well. The actual people, the monks, the nuns, the religious people, uh, they left England, or some of them left England. Most of them didn't. Most of them stayed behind, and they joined the, they joined Henry's new church. Many of them just, the, the men, the women, of course, couldn't because there were no Shinpu uh, Sama who were women. The only uh, role for uh, the, the, the priestly role, it had to be, it had to be a man. And they weren't allowed to marry. You see, he kept the Catholic rule until he died. He was not a Protestant in his thinking. They had to follow the Catholic rule until he died. And the actual buildings, uh, some of them were destroyed, uh, many of them were left in ruins, and still, still we can see these. Uh, now I, I took them from Google and uh, some, mostly they are English ones, but a few of them are actually in other parts of Europe, or they're not, they're not English. But uh, something like this. this. This one is in the north of England, and they're still there today. You see, if you go through the English countryside, uh, you can see many of these ruins of the old monasteries. 
fair ruined choirs where late the sweet birds sang, as Shakespeare put it. Okay, they're, they're, they are all across the countryside. Okay, there's these um, dozens of them. I don't know how many there are, but they're still standing, the ruins from hundreds of years ago. Okay, this one is not English. It's a completely different style. And you can still see them. All right, they've, they've left their permanent mark on the landscape. These are the monasteries where the uh, monks and the nuns would uh, meet. And they did very important work. You see, this, well, it's gone now, but this pyramid system was very developed. And who looked after poor people? Who looked after sick people? Who looked after the education of children? The monks in the monastery. And when they were gone, England had a, a, a huge social problem, frankly, that was not resolved until the 19th century. Not fully resolved. Look, you look at Oliver Twist, okay, Duke Yuseki, uh, Charles Dickens, not sure, six, six. suffering little boy, okay, poor little boy, and Jin Ken Manai, Dani Mo Mamorete Nai. In the Middle Ages, the social system was better. And it was only in the 19th century that they began reforms to introduce a, a, a you know, really um, improve on this disaster, really, in the society. Women's education went down at this time because these buildings were emptied. Health went down because these people served as hospitals. And Charity for poor people went down. Uh, more and more poor people were out on the street with no money. Okay? And there was no safety net, there was no protection for those people. These had been, these monasteries had been the place where that kind of social system existed. And Henry got rid of it. So that caused quite a lot of social unrest and caused uh, social problems. Okay, and again in Henry VIII, he says, They that can pity here may, if they think it well, let forth a tear. Yoko kangare kara sanjin de sho. Yoko kangare kara nakitai. Okay? So, whether that means that he supported the Catholicism, or just that he supported the, the, the social structure and the stability that the monasteries gave, or whether it was a different reason, we don't know. But I've just said the positive sides of the monasteries. There were negative sides too. Okay? Some of those monasteries, they would slip women in at night. Okay? And they would slip in food and drink. And they were mamake mono, and they weren't really religious people, okay? They were just spending public money, taking the money, and sitting there and getting fat. Okay, so there were different feelings about the monastery. They, did, they offered some good things, but there were some bad things going on as well. So, uh, many of the convents and monasteries had fallen into corrupt ways. There had been quite a lot of popular resentment against them, even before Henry led England away from the Church of Rome. So there's that side as well. So they're not very nice. Okay. Um, ooh, I better move a little bit faster. He, he, he. <laughs> <laughs> We've only got a few minutes left. Uh, so, after breaking with the Catholic Church, Henry got tired of Anne, and uh, he put her to death. He killed her. He killed his wife. Not personally, but he ordered his wife to be killed. Uh, mostly because she didn't give him the son he wanted. And again, she only had a daughter, and again, that daughter became queen, and a very powerful 
apart from the very successful people. So again, uh, very important, these successful Tudor women. Um, we'll talk. We'll talk about that later on, of course. Now, it's very debatable exactly what happened here. Uh, she did try to influence the religious politics. She wanted the country to be more Protestant, and we don't really know exactly what was going on. But Henry accused her of sleeping with other men, including her own brother. Most historians think this is not true. They think Henry had some enemies, and he wanted to get rid of his wife, so he said, oh, no, I can accuse my wife of sleeping with my enemies. Kill the enemies, kill her, and I'm free. I can marry again, and I, I, I killed some of my enemies. So lots of historians don't believe that Anne was sleeping with other men. And uh, about three years later, after marrying, 1,000 days later, about, uh, she was beheaded. It said that Henry went hunting that morning. And so after that, he marries Jane Seymour and finally gets a son. And then dies. Naturally, she dies after giving Henry a son. So then he marries a German princess. The problem here was he never, he never saw her before marrying. She was recommended. He couldn't chop her head off. I mean, the thing is, he, when he saw her, he didn't like her. Okay. So he went through the ceremony, but he didn't sleep with her, he didn't want to be with her. Um, and uh, he chopped her head off the, the man who recommended her instead. It was a really dangerous time to be alive, okay? It, you know, if you were alive in Henry VIII's time, the best thing was to find a little vessel in the countryside and hide away quietly. If you were in London and you were famous, uh, you easily got your head chopped off. Okay? It was a dangerous time. And then, so, after uh, ending the marriage with Anne, he married Catherine Howard, and again, he chopped her head off. Notice... He chops the heads off the English women. He can't chop his Spanish princess's head off. He can't chop his German princess's head off because, you know, the, those people would, you know, their countries would make war. But the English girls, he can do what he wants. So he chops Catherine's head off. Again, the same reason she's sleeping with other men. In this case, possibly true. Historians are divided. They think there's more possibility that she was. And then his final wife, Catherine, lived longer than, 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 uh, than he did. And we have a little way of remembering this. Uh, we remember divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, survived. So the first wife he divorced. But of course, remember, if I'm going to be strict about it, divorced, uh, it was annulled. We, we, it's the same result. Um, divorced, beheaded, died. Divorced, beheaded, survived. There they are. Divorced, beheaded, died. Divorced, beheaded, survived. The six wives of Henry VIII. Okay? And that's about it, really, for today. That's, I think that's the end of the... Yeah, divorced, beheaded, died. Divorce beheaded survived and put it at Owari Tung.